Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm so excited we have a great show for you today and we'll continue in just a second. Hi everyone, I am so excited. I have a really special guest with me today and her name is Stacy Francis. And she has got so many initials after her names I can't go through them all, but anyway, Stacy is the president and CEO of Francis Financial, and it is a fee-free boutique wealth management, financial planning, and divorce financial planning firm dedicated to providing ongoing comprehensive advice for successful individuals, couples, and women in transition, such as divorce or widowhood. She is a certified financial planner, certified divorce financial analyst, sorry, a certified estate and trust specialist with over 20 years of experience in the financial industry. Stacy is also the founder of a nonprofit, Savvy Ladies, hosted a uh, host of the Financial Ever After podcast and the author of the white paper, Unveiling the Unspoken Truth, The Financial Challenges Women Face During and After Divorce, and Financial Help for Widows, The Complete Resource Guide. So let me welcome Stacy. I am so excited you're here with me. Thank you, Shira. It's great to be here too. Yeah, so let's dive right in. Um, I the. Ladies, you're going to get a wealth of information today. So let's just start off. So question, uh, losing a loved one can be really devastating and having to handle the financials can be extremely overwhelming in an already emotional time. So what are the three most important things to do when you lose a loved one? a loved one, it can be a very overwhelming time. And there's actually a, I call it a financial tsunami of, of you know, decisions that you have to make. Um, and there are three key things to do. Um, number one is to take a temperature check of really understanding um, where you are financially, what the income is now, because for the vast majority of women, their income goes down after their spouse passes away. Um, number two, getting really clear about what your budget is and what your new spending is going to be. For many people, it will be lower, but not always significantly lower than they, you know, maybe maybe not as low as, as they thought previously. And then third, really getting a handle around um, what your assets and liabilities look like, because that probably has changed too. Um, there may be life insurance money and, and what for. So those are the three key areas. And um, we can definitely dive into each one of how do you get a handle on um, the new income? How do you get a handle really on that cash flow management, what, what your spending is, your new spending, and then also what that new balance sheet looks like? I have a question, and I don't know if it's so relevant now, but I know when my father passed away in 82, like back then the men primarily took care of the finances. And mm -hmm. a lot of women found themselves in a state of not understanding or knowing anything about where all their money was, what was mm -hmm. going on, how to even put one foot in front of the other financially. Is that still the same nowadays or has that changed quite a bit? You, you bring up a good question. Um, and I have to say that for women, we've come a long way. Um, but we also have a long way to go. And for most partnerships, there is a division of labor. And uh, especially we see if you have children. One person takes care of certain tasks, the other one takes care of others. And typically the way that division of labor, not in all, a lot of partnerships, he ends up taking over the financial piece she ends up doing a bunch of other very important pieces, but but maybe not the, the financial piece. If she does have an active role in the finances, often it tends to be more so Shira with the everyday bill paying, cash flow management. And so finding herself now on her own, 
she may not have real clarity into all their different accounts, where they're located, the values of each, as well as the liabilities, what the current mortgage, home equity, line of credit, auto loans, credit cards. She may not have as clear a view into that as she does the day-to-day -day expenses. So we find um, that a lot of women who come to us, unbelievably bright, smart, but just when it comes to money, feel like they're very much behind the eight ball. And it's not that we as women can't understand this, that we, you know, we are just as capable as men when it comes to investing and, and doing this work. It's just usually we haven't had as much experience. We haven't had maybe as much exposure. Great. Thank you. That um, makes a lot of sense. All right. So uh, let me ask you another question. What is the specific financial documents that need to be collected during this time? So there are a plethora of documents and I have a fantastic report for, for everyone that you can um, look at and it's called the Financial Widow Resource Guide. And in there, we have listing of all the different documents you need. But what's most important to know is that you don't need to collect everything now. One of the biggest challenges, understandably, is women who uh, have lost a spouse and, and feeling like everything has to be done right now. And that actually is, is not the case. So we break it up into essentially time blocks so that you know during the first four weeks, during the first three months, the first six months, the first year, these are the things that you need to collect and these are the things you need to do. So the first thing is um, essentially obtaining a death certificate. And we recommend that you should request about 15 different copies of the death certificate. And that's a, that's a document that you're going to be giving to uh, life insurance companies to make claims on life insurance, financial institutions that might have brokerage accounts, savings accounts, retirement accounts, as well as other parties. Not every um, institution is going to require a uh, actual death certificate. Some will require just a copy of it, but making sure that you have 15 actual certified copies is important to make sure that for those um, that you that you have that information. The second thing you want to do is uh, you want to make sure that, again, um, you are choosing a funeral home. Often that funeral home will contact Social Security for you but sometimes they will not. And you may think um, that you don't, wouldn't need to contact Social Security if your spouse was not collecting security, Social Security, but you still should. The first reason is that you need to notify them um, if they are collecting benefits to stop, but you also may be eligible for a widow's benefit or a survivor's benefit. Your children, if you have children who are dependent on you, typically 16 years older, uh, old or, or younger, they may be also eligible for a benefit through Social Security. And the other piece, not that this is in a significant amount of money, um, but they will give you $255 through Social Security to help with offsetting costs, which I know that um, is really not significant, but there we go. It might pay um, for the death certificates, right? <laughs> exactly. It might it might help you with that. So I, I feel like it's a little bit of an insult, but you know, there we go. Um, the other thing you'll want to do uh, in relatively you know good time, other than you know getting a copy of their death certificate and letting Social Security know, is also contacting your spouse's employer. Um, that your spouse may be due unpaid salary. Um, they also most likely have a company sponsored life insurance plan or voluntary life insurance plan too, and they can let them know. Most likely there's um, some type of employer retirement account 
such as a 401k or 403b. There could even be uh, stock accounts, uh, such as restricted stock units or stock options or even deferred compensation. So that's very helpful and they will um, guide you with that information. They'll also give you information about health insurance so that you can continue on health insurance if you're on health insurance on your your spouse's plan to make sure that in no way do you have a gap in the health and coverage that maybe you need and your your children need. Um, so those are the three things to, to really focus on. And then you'll want to start to collect those financial records. And we have a, a fantastic uh, checklist of things that you should collect now versus things that you have some time to collect in the future. But of those things that are really important, it's um, making sure that you have your spouse's birth certificate, that you have a copy of the last will and testament, um, any trust documents, like I said, life insurance documents too. Um, if there are any um, burial instructions or cemetery plot deeds, um, any prepaid cremation documents or charitable donation preferences. Um, you know, those are all things that, that would be in a more time sensitive way. The things you can, you know, collect a little later down the line in a month or two would be just statements for checking, savings, essentially anything with a dollar sign. And we have a wonderful um, net worth statement that you can use too to start to fill out to make sure that you don't you don't miss any of those assets that maybe you know you didn't have full full view into. I guess it would be really great advice uh, for women who are still married and haven't um, uh, lost their spouse yet. Really to start to quest, ask questions and make a list and get information about all the different accounts that they have to make their life easier at a, yeah. at a later point instead of waiting until the last minute to try to figure this all out. Huh? Yeah, no, I sure you make a great point um, is that when it comes to understanding and managing your finances, information is is really power and those that have a clear picture of their finances from the income from expenses and from you know assets and and debts have a a, a much much better place after the loss of a spouse and quite frankly even during their their lifetime one of the biggest challenges that we all face and we know this when we're going through a traumatic time is that the emotional weight and the trauma that we are dealing with and the grief, it clouds our ability to think in a, in a clear way. It's almost like your, I find it almost like your brain is walking through mud. We forget things. It's harder to remember things. It's sometimes harder to, think clearly because you're just dealing with this state of pure overwhelm. And unfortunately that this statistic really shows how important it is, particularly for women to be active in the finances because eight out of 10 women at some point in their life, that means 80% of women are going to be on their own, making their own financial decisions solely at some point right? And for a lot of us, when we find ourselves in that situation because of the death of a spouse, even a disability of our, our partner, or a divorce, we are dealing with a very traumatic situation that is on our hands. And so, you know, being part of the finances is, is really one of the best things you can do for living a long-term, healthy, and financially secure life. That is really, really great advice um, because I'm sure not everybody who listens to my show is already widowed. You know, a lot of people are single or maybe thinking about going mm -hmm. through divorce. And even for women going through divorce, this could be really, really important to make sure that they know where all the assets are. So that way, yeah. um, you know, the spouse can try to hide things away from them that they're legally entitled to. 
Yes, and I will tell you, our superpower is working with widows whose spouses have passed away. And our other superpower as certified divorce financial analysts is working with women going through the divorce process. And we find the number of women that we are working with in both situations that don't have a full picture of the finances um, is often the majority of our clients. And so often we are going on a Sherlock Holmes sleuthing mission to try and find the assets. And in fact, I was scouring through one of the tax returns for a client of ours doing an x-ray analysis because she is going through divorce. Her spouse is not complying with discovery, which is a fancy way of saying he is not disclosing the assets. And so we were able to go through there with a fine tooth comb to backtrace any interest, dividends, and capital gains into accounts and then calculate and estimate the value. This wow. is not an easy task. It's very complex. And you know what? It's not inexpensive. And so the more you know, the more embedded in the finances you can be, the better you will find yourself if, God forbid, your divorce is one of the 50% that ends up, you know, sorry, your marriage is one of the 50% that ends up in divorce, or you're one of the millions of women who outlive their husband, because we live on average four years longer than our male counterparts. And often we marry and we're a little younger. And so for many women, we could be looking at, you know, a minimum of four to maybe even 10 years of, of living on our own after our, our partner has passed away. And we find that sometimes we have to do the same type of work for a happy marriage where she just hasn't been involved, trying to figure out what those assets are and having to do x-ray analysis. And essentially, you know, a little bit of forensic accounting to see what the assets actually are. And you know what? It doesn't mean that we found everything because there can be things that don't show up on the tax return that are out there. And for one of our clients, I will never forget this case, we found over 25 different accounts, but we know that that wasn't everything because we couldn't find everything, wow. right? So Especially, I guess if there's I, offshore accounts, forget it, huh? <laughs> it, you know, you can, you know, there are clues and I, I always, I always say this, I'm from the Midwest. And so I grew up, um, you know, and we had horses and cats and rabbits in a barn and way out in the country. And we always say, if you see mouse droppings, whether you like it or not, there's probably a mouse living in the house. And even though you don't see that mouse, that mouse, trust me, is there. Um, it's the same thing. So we can look for droppings, but sometimes we can't find the mouse. Um, and it's the same thing with those accounts too, that we can find droppings, we can see foreign interest, we can see um, you know, maybe transfers out of uh, checking accounts to another uh, bank account somewhere, but it can be difficult to, to actually trace it and figure out what the actual dollar amount is. Wow. Yeah, so start getting your hands in there now, ladies, and figuring out where all the money is in case you are part of that 50%. And if, you know, you have a spouse that's sick, um, yeah. they may not be able to help you go through this process either of figuring out where all your expenses are. And so it's good to start while they're healthy, figuring all this out so you know where to look in the future. Yeah, and, you know, Shara, I do have to say that you know, sometimes there is, there is malicious intent, and we call that financial abuse when she on purpose is being um, shunned from being able to see the finances involved in the finances. But the vast majority of marriages, that's not what's happening. And it's just complacency. It's the, you know, he's managing this and I do that. And I will tell you, the problem is, is that sometimes it can be too late. Uh, a client of us came to us and the only information she had about her finances was this very hastily written text by her husband who was dying of COVID on a ventilator in the hospital. And we used as much of that as we could, but I mean, it was, it was awful for her to know that in his last moments, this is what he was having to think about 
because they hadn't had this conversation. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I think having those conversations now while the person's still alive will save you a lot of grief on top of the grief later on. Yeah. Yeah. My it, mother, it my mother's outlived my father by over 40 years. Oh my. Yeah. yeah. My father passed away at 52 and my mother's in June will be 93, God willing. So. And how did she fare with the finances? Was it, was she, you know, involved in the finances or was she too, um, you know, finding herself having to kind of get up, get up to speed and, and learn a lot of this? I believe she had to get up to speed and learn a lot of this. Um, yeah. Luckily, my older sister is a CPA and also used to work in um, uh, stocks and stuff. So she's very savvy and knows a lot of information. And I'm sure she was a big help. I mean, I was in my early 20s. So, she, I mean, she must have been in her mid-20s, my sister. Um, but I'm sure she gave her some advice or people to go through, um, you know, when she was going through it, because I'm sure my father handled the majority of it. But I don't think she yeah. worked probably, she probably worked about another three or four, uh, maybe seven years and then retired. Mm -hmm. And that was it. She's been enjoying the high life since. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I give her credit of, of diving in. And, um, you know, I think what 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 a lot of women worry about, um, I don't know, you've heard of is, you know, the bag lady syndrome. Um, you know, a lot of us have that, that fear, especially after going through a divorce or our, our partner has, has passed away. And I will tell you the, the best way to combat that fear is, is knowledge. Um, and you know, having a financial advisor, a fee only a fiduciary, an independent financial advisor, create a financial roadmap out to, I would say at least age 95, because you know that we have clients who are living to 95 um, and, and sometimes even beyond to make sure that the lump sum of money that you have is sufficient based on your expenses to get you out that far. Right. And that initial plan Sometimes it works and it looks beautifully. Um, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. But that is so important of, okay, what are the changes that we need to make? Do we need to invest the portfolio differently than it was when you were married? Do we need more engine it? Do we need more growth incomes, income and dividends? Do we need to look at our expenses? And do we need to change maybe our housing expenses, bring that back? Do we need to up our income in different ways as far as maybe a part-time job or even relaunching our careers if we've been out of the workforce for a certain amount of time? Do we need to make sure that we are claiming Social Security with the best strategy, whether it's the mother's benefit, the survivor's benefit, and you know when do you need to claim? Um, these are all things that, again, an independent fee-only fiduciary financial advisor can help you with so that they look at your holistic picture, your entire financial life, to make sure that everything is being optimized and protected so that you have peace of mind knowing that you and your loved ones are going to be financially secure and and safe that's what we all want and and we all deserve it absolutely absolutely so let me ask you uh so if your spouse was working how do you navigate oh well we talked you talked about it a little bit but you can go further into it how do you navigate handling his or her retirement accounts and those benefits so there are different types of retirement accounts there's the um uh one that most people are familiar with which is a defined contribution plan. Defined contribution plans um, have pools of money and you can get that money and you can roll it over to your name. Um, they're also uh, known as 401ks. If they are at a charity, 
uh, a nonprofit or a governmental institution. It might be also known as a 403B, a TDA. Um, they have different names, a 457. And so the beneficiary on that account is going to be their spouse. In fact, um, you're required to have the spouse's name um, unless there's been a sign off by you, which you would know. So it's going to just transfer over to your IRA, which is great. So that's pretty simple. But there are other retirement accounts called defined benefit plans. And defined benefit plans are known also as pensions. And a defined benefit plan, often your spouse is entitled to a stream of income once they retire, often age 60 or 65. If they are already collecting that benefit, um, you may be able to have that income continue, but have it paid to you. And so this is where you need to reach out to that employer to find out what are the payment options if they were to have passed away. And originally when they became an employee, they made that decision of if they pass away, does 100% get continued and paid out to you? Is it 75, is it 50, or maybe even it's 0%. And so that's really important to understand what are the different payout options that were chosen when they started to receive the pension. Um, if that pension has not been in payout, then the employer often can actually estimate what the lump sum is valued at. And you may even be able to take that lump sum instead of waiting for a payout and again, rolling it over to your name. What is best for you? Well, it really depends. It depends on your age. It depends on your risk tolerance. It depends on what your income goals are. And again, a financial advisor, fee only fiduciary independent financial advisor can help you with that calculation to better understand, should you continue that spousal benefit, get a, an income, or should you have that roll over to your name in a lump sum? So there are a lot of, again, payout options and understanding which one you're entitled to and what is best for you is, is really important and key. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I know we're going to, we have just a few minutes left. Um, so just one, I, maybe I'll let you finish up on what you think is the most important last point. And then, you know, yeah. we'll share everybody uh, with everyone what it is that you would like to share with our audience and give them. So. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I, the last piece that I will say of, of anything that we've spoken about, Shira, that I'm really happy we're ending on is the importance of putting a team in place. After the loss of your, your partner, you need support from friends and family, but you also need support of the right professionals. And so making sure that you have the right estate planning attorney to help you with probating the estate and answering all those legal questions, making sure that you have the mental health support, that you have a grief counselor or a therapist that has a specialty in grief, and also that you have a financial advisor. And I know I said this a few times, um, that you want a fiduciary fee only independent advisor. What that means is fiduciary, they by law have to put your interests ahead of their own. Nice. Fee only means that they don't receive any commissions from selling you insurance or selling you annuity. They only are essentially working for you and what's in your best interest. And independent means that they have the world's oyster of investment options for recommendations for you to make sure that you have the most robust and solid portfolio ever. It's really important to work with a certified financial planner, a CFP, who is competent, who's trustworthy, who understands your needs, who you, you know sees you, who you know hears you. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me and I can recommend if we're a good fit, that's great, but sometimes we're not. And we can recommend advisors that we know and trust across the country to be able to help you to make sure that you have a team member who has your best interests at all times and is helping you forge that secure financial path. Thank you. That is so awesome. And 
you can find Stacy or her team at francisfinancial.com. And she has an amazing web uh, podcast here. Uh, do you want to just? Yeah. So thank you for sharing a fantastic podcast called Financially Ever After. And um, we have five years of beautiful content and we're continuing to release new content every other week everything that women who are on their own need to know whether you're thinking about or going through a divorce or your spouse has been diagnosed with a terminal disease or unfortunately they have passed away everything you need to know to maximize your the money you have make good decisions and make sure that you have the future income and growth from your portfolio that you need Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off and we will see you next week. Bye.